I have played golf exactly one time. I, I did really well. I got a high score, <laughs> which apparently is not how you're supposed to play golf. Um, I could do mini golf fairly well as long as I'm going up against windmills and dinosaurs. That's fine. Um, I believe I would have done better at golf if I would have known the magical word mulligan uh, before I started playing. It's this notion that you can just kind of redo. Like, you take a shot, you mess it up, and you say, oh, I'm taking a mulligan, and you can redo that. You probably can't do that for every shot, um, and that's fine. But it's this notion of the second chance, a do-over, the extra life in a video game, all of these things that are so important when you're playing games. Because too often times, what happens? We'll do something in a game that we're playing, and, and we, we know we have messed up. There have been numerous times where I have placed the circle or the X in the wrong part. There have been many times where I have dropped the, the little chip thing in the wrong slot on Connect 4. All of these times. And you can't take that back. See, that's the hard part. Whenever you do something, you tend to not be able to take it back. But there are certain rules in certain games that allow you to have a chance to redo things. The point is this. You try it again with extra knowledge. You've seen what doesn't work. You know what doesn't work. And therefore, uh, to take your mulligan, to take your extra chance or use your extra life, the point is simple. You have more knowledge so you can make a better decision now. In a sense... The justification that we have in Christ functions in the same way. Theologically speaking, justification uh, works to give us a second chance. As Paul speaks about it, it's this newness of life, as it were. That we are having this new life in Jesus Christ. We have been justified by faith. There's nothing that you can do in order to gain the justification. See, that's different than how we live our lives. Growing up in the 90s, I can remember uh, arcades. It's hard to find arcades nowadays. Uh, you can go to Chuck E. Cheese's, and I hate that because it's basically Las Vegas for toddlers. Um, but arcades functioned because video games were hard, and they made video games very hard, so you had to keep pumping quarters into it. So as long as you had a pocket full of quarters, you could play regardless of if you were good or not. That was how these machines made their money. But when video games started going into homes, they had to drastically redo things. And still, when you go to arcades, they function in the same way. I can't put enough quarters in the cosmic uh, video game that is life in order to continually do things over again. I can't pay the debt that sin has incurred on my own. It's not something that we can do. And so our justification found through the death and uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ pays that price for us. It's wonderful. It's great. It's all done by faith. And taken to an extreme, people will say, hey, you're good. Yeah, I mean, you've been justified by faith, right? So you can just do whatever it is that you want. And this was a problem that people had with uh, Luther's theology at the time. That there is no uh, moral formation. Everyone just gets a freebie. And this is what Paul addresses. Except that Luther, Paul, and even Calvin kind of all have this same notion that something has to happen. There has to be more than just sitting back and, and letting the justification happen. Now, it's true. Nothing you can do will merit your salvation at all. But you have to live differently. Calvin would call this uh, the fruits of being elect. And, and Luther would say, well, it just shows the justification, the, the things that we do, the things that we say, how we live our lives. All of this shows what Christ has already done for us. Because there has to be a change. Because when you encounter Jesus, something has to change. 
Paul, it would seem, is of the same mind. In fact, he answers the question, what are we supposed to do now? We've been justified by God. Wonderful, terrific. We all love to hear that. So does that mean we should just keep sinning? And the answer, of course, is no. That makes no sense. It makes no sense at all because you're different. See, when you come to know Jesus... You're different. You, you change. Your life has to change in some way. And, and Paul explains how this works. He says, look, you are baptized in Christ's name. We become a part of the body of Christ. Cool. So when Christ died, that death that he died to sin wiped out our sin. That was our debt that was paid on the cross. So your sins are forgiven, past, present, future, all of it. Awesome. But wait, there's more, because what that means is since we died the death like Christ died, and we are raised to new life when Christ is raised to new life, because that's the key here. The resurrection of Christ is this new life. And since we have died to sin, we are resurrected into this new life, the newness of life, which means that things are different now. You must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You have changed. Paul will use other language to describe this, and the language that he uses is very charged. A new creation, completely and utterly new. I've lived my life a lot of different ways. And I've actually tracked different trends that I have had over the years. And it's, it's very interesting to me. Typically on Sundays, this is what I have. A suit, a tie, uh, my stole. When on special occasions, I'll bust out the robe because it's important. You're not going to see me up here in shorts and a t-shirt. That would be kind of weird. But throughout the week, when I'm not doing anything special, you know, that's typically what I'll wear. Shorts on, flip-flops, and just a t-shirt. That's who I am. I always find it interesting how people dress and, and the shirts that people wear because it actually tells a lot about them. You'll never see me in a Michigan shirt. It doesn't happen. You'll never see me in a Steelers shirt. It ain't gonna happen. Unless if it does... Something terrible has happened, and I lost a bet. Because you all know me. You know I like the Buckeyes. You know that I love my Browns. You know all of this about me. And so if I were to show up suddenly in something else, you would think something has happened. Our lives function the same way. The things that you do, the things that you say, show the type of person that you are. Paul is imploring his listeners to live into the justification of Christ, the sanctification that God is working through with the Holy Spirit, this molding and shaping, conforming us to the image of Christ. Because you cannot, I will repeat this, you cannot be the same person that you are, that you were in Christ Jesus. Does that mean you were a terrible person? No. It just means you're different now. And the problem is that that causes problems. People would suggest that this is this free pass, right? You can just do whatever it is that you want, except that it puts us on a collision course with the world. Our reading in Matthew shows this because our reading in Matthew is terrifying. There's no other way to put it. Do not think that I have come to bring peace, but a sword. Whoa. This is the same guy who says we should love people. That boils down the law and the prophets to love God and love people. That's what he's saying. Now he's saying it's a sword. Father against son, mother against daughter. Enemies or members of your own house. There's this disconnect, it would seem, because Jesus preaches love and hospitality and companionship and all of these wonderful things. But what he was saying here is that he didn't come for politics. 
The notion of the Messiah dating back to a, an understanding of the Davidic covenant was what? That there would be a member of David's family on the throne always. Cool, great, wonderful. This means logically to the people then that the Messiah would come, kick out the Romans, and establish an Israeli ethnostate. That was the notion that they had in their head. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm doing here. He says, I'm here to do something else, playing a bigger game, as it were, because what good is it to gain your life and lose yourself? This passage that he, that, that he gives here acknowledges just how hard it is to live in the newness of life. You can have people that can destroy the body. They're not going to be able to touch the soul. So what's more terrifying? Dying or losing everything about who you are? Complete and utter annihilation, as it were. Those are the stakes. And Jesus acknowledges, this is hard. Therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. It's not a half-in, half-out situation that we find ourselves in. And this is what Paul reads and hears and understands. You can't, you can't just dip your toes into the pool of Jesus and be cool with it. You're either in or you're out. It's that simple. He acknowledges that this is going to cause enmity between people. He acknowledges that this is going to cause problems. Jesus is not the cause of the problems per se. But he challenges us. What we have to remember is that we call ourselves Christians. And if we want to be cool and hip, we'll say, oh, we're followers of Jesus. It's all the same thing. Most people will say, you're a Christian. You follow Jesus. Cool. Wonderful. And I cannot ever stress this enough that Christian literally means Christ-like. It means you have chosen because you have been chosen to live your life differently, to act differently, to hold yourself differently because you know better. You understand now. You see the world as it truly, truly is. There's a problem because the community of believers creates conflict simply by existing. Here's a fun fact. I could stand up here and preach for three hours if I wanted to. I could filibuster all of you if I, I'm not going to, so put the pitchforks away. Like, don't worry about that. But I could. And you guys would stay. And the reason you would stay is because you have decided that Christ is more important than going to Applebee's or Bob Evans after worship. That whatever plan you have, this trumps it. I've run into this issue several times. Growing up historically, my family would have a family Christmas Eve party every Christmas Eve. The way that it worked was always simple. Uh, we would go to my grandparents' house uh, when they were uh, around and able to host us. We would stay there until it was time, usually... Seven, eight o'clock, I think, thereabouts. And then we'd go over to church, we'd have the candlelight service, and then we would go home. That's how it worked. And I screwed that up. I screwed that up because I have different plans on Christmas Eve now. The things that once happened can't happen. I'm a little bit busy on that day. Easter Sunday functions the same way. 
And so what happened in the past couldn't happen anymore. And it was this learning curve that myself and my family had to have that it was basically, look, look, if you want me involved in these things, awesome, cool, wonderful, we got to change it or I'm not going to be there because I have things that are more important. We live less than an hour from Cleveland, which means if I had the, the, the money... I could go see the Browns lose in person. I'm a pessimist about, like, it's, it's complicated, okay? But I could go see a live football game whenever I wanted. Except when those start, it's problematic. I have had people call and say, hey, you want to buy season tickets to the Cleveland Browns? I'm like, that would be amazing. I'm not going to. Why? I'm a little busy on Sundays. And that's typically when football games play. My kids have had to make choices between what sports they're going to play because of when games happen and things like that. Because following Christ means a change, means a sacrifice, means giving up something. The coming age of peace is going to be here, but it's not here yet. Simply by following Jesus, you create conflict. It shouldn't be that way. I'm going to be very clear. It's, it's silly to me that that's the case, but that's how the world works. It creates a problem. And it creates a problem, and that means it creates division. But you can't be half in and half out. You either follow Christ or you don't. It doesn't matter if it makes you popular or not. It doesn't matter if people are upset by what you do. What matters is you follow Christ. And you follow Christ because Christ has given you this new life. It's tough. Our loyalties have to be to Christ and Christ alone. We cannot do things in the old way of life. What's the old saying? No better, do better. Or use G.I. Joe. Now I know, and knowing is half the battle. We have to be different. And being different in a world that believes conformity is the key is a challenge. While there will be peace eventually, we, we believe that, right? We believe everything is going to be fine. The resurrection of the body, uh, everything will be fine. And Jim Dandy, eventually, we ain't there yet eventually it's all going to be fine. All of this is not going to cause peace here and now. It's going to create conflict. It's going to create tension. It's going to create uncomfortable times and things that we have to do. And Jesus' words here are simple. Don't be afraid. One of the things I've always wanted to do is to have a Bible. And I want two words in large, friendly letters on the front of that Bible. Don't panic. Eventually, things will be fine. It, it, all of the troubles, all of the problems that are created simply by following Christ, I promise you, this too shall pass. It may pass like a kidney stone, but it's going to pass. The simple fact of the matter is we follow Christ. Period. Nothing else before Christ. That's what it means to be different. Because we know better. We have accepted this second chance. We have accepted this do-over. We know what it is we're supposed to do. We were given the gift of doing things differently, that we don't have to continue in sin anymore, that we don't have to continue in fear and terror and things like that. All we have to do is reach out and take it. Amen.